1946, in the heart of Brazil, on the banks of the Rio das Mortes in the Mato Grosso. A Brazilian Air Force DC-3 on reconnaissance flies at low altitude over a village of Chavante Indians without any previous contact with the outside world. The war of pacification has started. July 28, 1984, Geneva Airport, Switzerland. Mario Giruna, a Chavante Indian and a member of the Brazilian National Congress, arrives in Geneva for the first time to take part in the UN Working Group on Indigenous Populations. With Alvaro Tucano of the Union of Indigenous Nations, he is going to speak on behalf of the 220,000 Brazilian Indians. Indian summer in Geneva. Indigenous peoples of the Americas at the United Nations. The indigenous peoples of the world have never been considered by international organizations as nations with rights to land and their own government. First and foremost, human rights are considered as those of individuals not of peoples. As early as 1923, Chief Descahe of the Iroquois tried in vain to have the sovereignty of the Six Nations Iroquois Confederacy accepted by the League of Nations in Geneva. He based his request on the recognition of the Iroquois Confederacy by the Netherlands, England, France, the United States, and Canada through treaties to which these countries were party. Supported by sectors of public opinion in Geneva and Europe, as well as by several member states of the League of Nations, Descahe's mission provoked a stiff response from Canada, which was a member of the League, although still a British Dominion. The government of the Dominion declared the question of the Six Nations a purely internal matter of no concern to the League. Furthermore, it questioned the ability of Descahe to represent his people and decided to speed up the process of assimilating the indigenous peoples of Canada. Fifty years later, in 1973, Indian consciousness exploded at Wounded Knee in the United States. The United States had its army and its planes and bombs and its high-powered weapons and tanks surrounding the village of Wounded Knee. And Nixon, Ehrlichman, the BIA officials, everybody was ready to move in and kill all of the Indians at Wounded Knee with this high power weapons. And they wanted to do that. The general in charge especially wanted to do that because he wanted to test out some of his new weapons. And that's all in the record of the trial. And what we saw very clearly after Wounded Knee was that the reason that didn't happen was because international attention was on Wounded Knee. That was the first really international attention that we got. And that was when we needed it. That's when we had to have it. And we got telegrams and letters of support from all over the world at the same time, which helped to raise our awareness that there were other people struggling to free themselves from some form of colonization. On February 27th, 1973, about 300 Oglala Sioux from the Pine Ridge Reservation in South Dakota occupied the village of Wounded Knee and claimed independence for the Oglala Nation. In exactly the same place, one December day in 1890, the group led by Chief Bigfoot was massacred by American troops, thus marking the end of the conquest of the West. The occupation showed the world what living conditions were like in Pine Ridge. 
an average yearly income of less than $2,000 per family, an unemployment rate of 54%, which reaches 80% in winter, 70% of the inhabitants suffering from malnutrition, 30% of the women sterilized, more than one third of the children raised away from their families and culture, a life expectancy rate of 46 years. Since the turn of the century, Indians in the United States have lost an average of 45,000 acres of land each year. After 71 days of siege at Wounded Knee, the Indians laid down their arms. Order was once more restored on the Pine Ridge Reservation. What we realized from that during Wounded Knee was that we had to go about international work much more strategically. We had to organize we had to find the ways that, the most stupid bureaucratic ways that is acceptable to the United Nations, to the body of nations, to make an entry into international affairs. The only thing that was new to us was making that bureaucratic effort, making the organizational effort to spend years finding out how to be effective in international affairs. We didn't see ourselves ever as, as out of international affairs. We are, we are nations of people who are, should be as much a part of the world as any other nations of people, but it's not seen that way because the America has, the United States has guns. We don't have guns. That's the only reason it's not seen that way. On September 20th, 1977, about a hundred delegates from 15 countries of North, Central, and South America crossed the threshold of the United Nations in Geneva. They were led by the International Indian Treaty Council, the first indigenous organization to obtain the status of non-governmental organization at the UN. The delegates, representing nearly 20 million Indians, brought out very clearly during the conference the four issues of greatest importance to them all. Those of nationhood, land rights, genocide, and self-determination. The words of prophecy addressed by Chief Seattle in 1854 to the President of the United States were recalled by Russell Means of the Oglala Sioux. Tribe follows tribe and nation follows nation. It's like the waves of the sea. It is the order of nature, and regret is useless. Your time of decay may be distant, but it will surely come. For even the white man's God, who walked and talked with him as friend with friend, could not escape the common destiny. We may be brothers after all, we shall see. Hetchet your love. It symbolized, uh, I guess, two things. In, in a way, it was the culmination of the work of so many people, the work of Descahe, the work of the, the people in Oregon who had gone to the United Nations back in the 40s and 50s, the culmination of the efforts of Frank Fool's Crow of the, the Lakota Nation. And it was something good for me because it meant that we had actually done something. So I felt personally that we had, we had made some, some effective change. But it also meant the, a real beginning for us. Instead of just the, the end of a long struggle, it meant finally the gates are open in some way. Finally we can get in, we can get back into the world, we can talk freely, we can say what our problems are, we can get solidarity from peoples all over the world. Since August 1982, the Working Group on Indigenous Populations has met every year at the United Nations. This group was set up by the Sub-Commission on Prevention of Discrimination and Protection of Minorities 
which formulates recommendations to the Commission on Human Rights. The indigenous delegates come to the working group in order to describe, in the presence of their government's representatives, the violations of fundamental freedoms that their people are suffering. They also contribute to discussion on the formulation of standards aimed at guaranteeing the rights of the 200 million indigenous people throughout the world. What is the role of the United Nations? What has the UN done for the world? As Indians, we would like to participate in the administration of the UN. Then Indians can change the system and current practices. The white man has only brought trouble to the Indian. Vice, alcohol, and wickedness. Never happiness. Only misery for the whole nation, the whole country. The white man is not worth much, my friends because he is a killer. The white man enjoys killing others. He is heartless, without conscience, without morals. Thirty years ago, I lived happily beyond the Rio das Mortes, in my region, the Serra do Roncador, at the sources of the Rio das Mortes and the Xingu. It was the territory of the Chavante. At that time, I had never seen a white man, nor a plane, nor a road. I had never seen them because the land was sacred and respected. Although in Brazil, the Indian is still legally a minor under state guardianship, Mario Juruna entered the National Congress in 1982. Elected by the inhabitants of the slum area in the south of Rio de Janeiro, he's the first Indian from his country to sit in Parliament. I will fight for the workers' right to a salary, for the Indians' right to his land, he said. Returning to the land of the Chavante, to Namuncura in the state of Mato Grosso, Mario Juruna is welcomed as a cacique by his people. And the Indian who once occupied this land, his own land, 
The Indian no longer has any land. Today we occupy a very small territory, only just enough to survive. But the Indian will no longer live as a Chavante, as a member of a tribe, or as a chief. He will be mixed up like mud, or sand, or cement, or stones. And thus, we will go on till doomsday. most difficult problem in the UN we still have, it has never stopped to this day, and that is when, when I first started working permanently in 1975 at the UN in New York, I would meet with delegates from African countries and they would still laugh at me. Oh, you're an Indian, isn't that funny? And other people would say, I thought you had all been killed. So we had to spend at least two years convincing people that we still existed and that we were people to be respected as humans and as nations of people. And that's a fight that still goes on. We are not taken seriously, partly because of the immense worldwide propaganda of primarily of the U.S., through Hollywood films, through comic books, through all of the ways that they show us as savage people that are somehow comical, but defeated, basically defeated savages. The worst thing of all is to be born an Indian in Brazil. We don't have any equality with the whites. When I speak of the whites, I mean the ones with power to dominate, not the slum dwellers. The white man, he's the one who wants to dominate and exploit. Next to these people, we don't feel equal. But we feel equal with exploited people, with those who are aware. We are not the only exploited ones. There are thousands of us, millions. That's how I see it. We need to become more aware, because those who govern us do not tell the truth. They have never represented the Brazilian people, and even less do they represent the indigenous communities.
No nosso modo de ver, o progresso do branco não é o progresso. For us, the white man's progress doesn't mean progress. The dam at Itaipu, for example, has already flooded the lands of the Guarani Indians. This destruction, this progress, has harmed not only the indigenous population, but also the peasants. Causou também casos sérios às populações camponesas. A outra usina hidrelétrica que é Tucuruí. The other dam, Tukurui, represents a big danger because 100,000 families are threatened with death from the poison dropped by planes exploiting the forest. The water of the planned lake will be contaminated, putting all the population of Bellum at risk. More than 25,000 monkeys will die and more than seven and one half million acres of land will be flooded. This kind of progress is a complete tragedy for us. What I hope for from Europe and from Europeans is that at least a few of them will make a huge effort to make their children and their countrymen more aware, to enable the Indians of Brazil to continue their resistance and that this resistance will be seen as a good example for Europeans. This is what we would like white people to understand. The structure of the United Nations, I think, is a miniature of the world. People come here, countries come here, to get what they can from the countries that have power. The countries that have power come here to maintain their power. So there is there is no one here as a country that can basically take up our struggle with us in solidarity in a very serious way. When Puerto Rico first, for example, went to the decolonization committee in uh, 75, the United States delegates went to various countries that sat on the decolonization committee and basically threatened them, like the mafia would threaten somebody. If you vote for Puerto Rican decolonization, we will take your money away or we will shoot you. with the guerrillas in the mountains of Guatemala. En Guatemala la mayoría somos indígenas. In Guatemala, indigenous people are in the majority. In the course of the last four years, we have seen many terrible things on our territory. Perhaps Madam Chairman is going to tell me that the subject of this meeting is the issue of land. We, the Indians of Guatemala, believe we can defend our lands, our culture, everything, as long as we are allowed to live. In Guatemala, the principal problem is one of life and death. En Guatemala, el problema principal es la vida. Two, three, four, five, six skulls of our compañeros. Here are my brothers. That's where they were thrown. 
wurden im Lager umgebracht. They were killed at the encampment. The army discovered them and tried to interrogate them. But they refused to speak. So they took one and tortured him. They cut off his fingers as an example. Then they brought them here, near to the hiding place, and hung them, including the children. There are 19 people here, 19 people killed by the army. If the people of Guatemala, if the Indian people have got to leave their land, seek refuge, hide in different parts of the country, it is because life is impossible in their territory. As many indigenous brothers have explained in this room, as they have said, life for us is the land, life for us is nature. Because we owe everything to her, we live through her. Therefore, if our people have abandoned all this, it is simply because we can no longer live on our territory. We travel at night because our lives are in danger. We are being chased by soldiers. They kill us and destroy our corn. We have no food left to eat. How many children do you have? Two, and two others who were killed by the army. Because of this, we need to make our case known, to have it studied and become the subject of inquiries, because we aren't a species of fish. We are human beings. We have a culture and an existence that we mustn't lose. This is how it is. We can't be silent about the situation here or elsewhere. It is our duty to speak of it. The military has created, in the regions most affected by repression, centers of development. The aim is, according to the government, to rehabilitate the population and incorporate it in a national program of production. In fact, it is a policy to control the survivors, based on the creation of strategically placed hamlets and a peasant militia, the civil guard. Why do they massacre the people? On one hand, they massacre them because they have an interest in not allowing the people to open their eyes, become organized and united, to combine their forces. And one of the reasons for the massacres is to crush and stifle popular movements. This is what the government calls action against guerrillas, 
against subversion. And I can tell you that the government claims shamelessly to be taking action against guerrillas. All the same, it knows full well that to speak of subversion in Guatemala is to speak of the humble peasants who try to obtain justice through being organized. To speak of subversion is to speak of the mother whose son is dead, of the child who has lost his parents and is an orphan in an all-out war. Therefore, it is only natural that they should take a stand and find an organization to defend them. Robin, 22 years old, Kiche. Samuel, 18, Can Joval. Chepe, 15, Chu. Enrique, 16, Mom. Israel, 19, Quiche. Vidal, 17, Cacoltec. Policario, 17, Cacchiquel. a dream, many other Indians have a dream of, of making our sovereignty as Indian nations primarily with each other as we started out before we were colonized, of making a real organization of Indian nations like the organization of African states that would work together economically. We could, we could several Indian nations in, in the Americas have economic co-ops for growing coffee, cattle, different things. We could begin trading with each other economically. We could begin trading with each other culturally. What, what people are now learning in Nicaragua could be very useful to us in Bolivia or in the United States. And of course, in the international work, it's, it can be more effective as we continue working together. Everybody exploits us, including you who are filming me. And with this film, you're going to make money, and me, I won't have a cent. You're using me like everybody else. In other countries, people will pay to see the film. You must give me 50,000. If you show it in other countries, you will earn much more than that, while I will have nothing. Will you give me some money? Because I am also taking part in your film. Because of you, I am late for my work with my animals, and my dog has run away from fright. I don't receive any help from anyone. They've forgotten my people, and that includes the government, who could at least give us a pump for water. And me, I am suffering here, sad and in distress. How many Quechua Aymara uh, there are in Bolivia? Uh, in Bolivia? In Bolivia, more than 85% of the population. I prefer to speak of the Andes because Bolivia is ephemeral. So in the Andes, we are 22 million Quechua, from southern Colombia, through Ecuador, Peru, Bolivia, to northern Argentina and Chile. 
and I estimate that there are approximately five million Aymara. In several of these countries, you are the majority. In Ecuador, Peru and Bolivia, we are in the majority. So what does it mean in these countries, the word decolonization for the Indians? For us, breaking with colonialism can only mean having an Indian government for the Indian people. Here, there isn't even a school for our children. There is no progress at all. We don't know anything. We don't know how to read or write. We can't even complain to our government. If we could have a school now, our children would not be as ignorant as we are. We receive absolutely no help from the government, neither for our land nor for our animals. We haven't any money. Our land is poor and we have nothing to sell at the market. I am helpless against the drought. Without pastures, my animals will die. There is no water. For me, there is a total fundamental relationship between liberation and culture. A people can only liberate itself if it builds its ideological implements from its own culture. Any other form of liberation is simply another form of colonialism. The Indian civilization, the Tawantinsuyu, is a reflection of the cosmic harmony on a human scale. We are a communal people. A plant shows us how to undertake politics because the cells of a plant are organized to fulfill different functions. They don't fight among themselves. Our body is a perfect political organization. Why? Because it is communal. After, before, and during the 77 conference, we realized that we could make a, a more formal relationship with other indigenous peoples that would be mutually beneficial and that, that could be systematic, that, that could go on no matter of, of who got killed in what country and on which day. And that has worked very well. We've, done, we've been able to, to do some very effective work on behalf of the Mapuche Indians in Chile, for example. We've done some reasonably effective work on Indians in Brazil. Our, uh, our delegate here in Geneva is a Mapuche Indian who, who started working with us a few years ago. And we are, we're able to, to have a kind of mutual protection and that also forces the UN to look at us a little more seriously, to look at the problem, especially in the Americas, in Hawaii, Australia, Oceania more seriously. There's an island by the sea. Beautiful San Island. During the 70s, over 100 homeless native Hawaiian families took refuge on this island in the middle of the port of Honolulu, which had served as a public garbage dump. They cleaned it up and resume their traditional way of life closely linked to the ocean. Beautiful San Island Beautiful San Island In the midst 
Off all his garbage, Mother Nature made my home. By the shores of San Island. If human rights are to mean anything other than rhetoric, and if they are to be applied to anyone other than those already enjoying them, they must first be experienced by indigenous people who are the prior inhabitants of the continents and islands of this world. Most basic among these rights are those of self-determination, that is, rights to live on and control our lands and to pass on our culture to future generations. As peoples rather than populations, we also have international rights as nations to take our place among the society of nations. Beautiful Sand Island In the beginning of the 80s, 180 acres of the island were reclaimed by the state of Hawaii for industrial and recreational development. This meant the eviction, without any compensation, of the entire community. Beautiful Sand Island Beautiful Sand Island man this is time either we do it or else forget it forget about our rights what you guys this guy try to do what with us we're not indians we are hawaiian people natives this is our life The response to this among our people recently, the last 10 years or so, has been to resist it, to resist tourism, to resist the American military. And the two forms of resistance are to occupy the land, which we have done regarding the American military's bombing of one of our islands, one of our sacred islands. Um, and the other one is to do political organizing in the communities. And an extension of political organizing is to do networking throughout the Pacific. So our first international outreach is in the South Pacific to the Tahitians and their independence movement because they want to be independent from France, to the Canucks in New Caledonia because they want to be independent of France, to the Australian Aborigines, um, to the Micronesians who are, are negotiating with the United States to be independent. Our second international um, networking is here, is, is to come to some place like Geneva or to go to the United States, um, to the mainland and link up with American Indians because although we are culturally different, we're still indigenous people and we have the same colonizing power, which is America. June 3rd, 1985, on the beach of Waimanalo. You feed, Charlie, you feed any place. <laughs> One touch, good. Yeah. That's all. <laughs> that they may understand, that they may become more patient, and yeah, fully. that okay. they may love the people who stand on their rights. 
be with our people, O oh Lord, wherever they are, in Hawaii or elsewhere, that somehow in their hearts they may know that they are Hawaiians and be proud that they are Hawaiians. So be with us, O oh Lord, as we stand firm on this aina. Maka inoa kamakua kikeiki ameka uhani hemolele. The community decided to resist eviction from their ancestral homelands, now a public beach area. All indigenous people are caught in the east-west conflict. Um, the Soviet Union and Eastern Europe say that they're more sympathetic, but they have indigenous people too. They mistreat other indigenous people. Um, the West gives humanitarian aid, so-called, but they prevent all kinds of tribal um, collective living arrangements by taking the land, by using the land. So both, we, we understand as indigenous people that we are caught in this struggle. The spirit is on that check. Your families will be cursed. You Therefore, the rest of the world can benefit from what indigenous people do and say and from our own culture. The rest of the world doesn't understand that, and we know that. Um, they're used to consuming their environment, wasting their environment, polluting their environment. But all indigenous people that I've talked to here understand what Hawaiians call aloha aina, which means the love of the land. That's our cultural relationship to the land. It expresses our philosophical and economic relationship to the land. All indigenous people that I've met have that relationship. Um, and so we have something to, to teach the rest of the world, which is that you can live in harmony with your relations, whether they are animals or plants or, or the waters of the world. And so we have something to give to the rest of the world. It's not just that we come here to complain. We come here to say to the rest of the world, what you are doing is insane. You will all blow yourselves up. You will end, you will end the, the beautiful cultures that the world has to offer. And we have an alternative way of living. Also, the UN has no, no way to deal with, with what are now called indigenous populations, which means colonized people who are not officially colonized according to the UN standards of who is colonized. I would rather say colonized people than indigenous people. I think it's a, a nonsense phrase. It has a, a hint of primitive peoples. So I don't like the idea. But if you're not officially classified in the United Nations as colonized peoples, there is no way for you to come to the United Nations. There is no way for you to come to the world court unless you are already recognized as a state by the United Nations or by the world court. So we still have no way to 
to enter the United Nations. It's necessary for us in the next 10-year period to change the United Nations. That's what we have to do.